Welcome to finding and evaluating open access publications in your discipline. My name is Danielle Applebaum, and I am the scholarly communication librarian at the Thomas T. Greenlee Library at Farmingdale State College. By the end of today's session, you will be able to differentiate between open access and openly licensed in the context of copyright, summarize and distinguish between green, gold, and hybrid open access pathways, Implement strategies for locating open access publishing opportunities utilizing library licensed and freely available resources. Describe characteristics of a predatory publication and critique open access and traditional publications using COPE's principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. So what is open access? There are a number of definitions, but I generally defer to this one. Open access is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. I think in a lot of ways this captures the ideal version of open access. That is, the idea that open access should be accompanied by relaxed copyright limitations. However, in the current landscape, it's important to keep in mind a baseline definition of open access that emphasizes digital, online, and free of charge. When it comes to reducing restrictions related to copyright, that's where open licensing, which is a system of communicating to users which of the exclusive rights of copyright have been relaxed and under what condition, comes in. We'll get to that in just a bit. A common misconception about open access is that it's a one-size-fits-all approach. However, there are many pathways to making a work openly accessible. We'll discuss these pathways in a moment, but I wanted to give you a good visual of the possibilities. This diagram from Stony Brook University illustrates nicely the multiple pathways to open access. As you can see, if the author goes the gold route, they submit to an open access journal, pay an APC if necessary, and their article is open access upon publication. If the author goes the green route, they publish in a traditional journal, locate an open repository, archive the work in accordance with the publisher's terms, and depending on those terms, they may be able to make the work available immediately or after an embargo. If the author wishes to go the hybrid route, they publish with a traditional journal that has an open access option, pay the article processing charge, or APC, and make the article open access upon payment of the APC. We'll discuss these in depth on the next couple of slides. Bronze Open Access, or Gratis Open Access, describes a form of open access in which a publisher makes content freely available but does not openly license the material. All rights are reserved under standard copyright. It's important to note that just because the copyright holder may choose to make this material openly accessible, they are not extending this right to users. Additionally, they have no obligation to make the material openly accessible indefinitely. Green Open Access describes open access that occurs when an author deposits their work in an openly accessible repository. This could be a preprint server, a subject-focused repository, or an author's institutional repository. It's important to note, however, that terms for what can be deposited and when it can be deposited are generally determined by the publisher and outlined in the publication contract. Again, making the work openly accessible via the green route does not necessarily entail the application of a specific open license or any open license at all. Hybrid open access refers to open access that occurs alongside non-open access material. For instance, in a hybrid open access journal, an author typically has the choice to publish their material as paywalled content or, for a fee, to publish the piece as an open access piece. Thus, open access and non-open access articles might appear side by side in the same issue of a journal. The open access status of an article might be immediate upon publication. However, it's possible for authors to elect and pay for their articles to become open access at any time in the future. Again, making the work openly accessible via the hybrid route does not necessarily entail the application of a specific open license or any open license at all. Finally, Gold open access is accomplished via submission to and publication by an open access journal. Because the journal is fully open access, the article is open access upon publication. Typically, authors pay an APC or article processing charge for gold open access, but this is not always the case. 
Although gold, green, and hybrid have become somewhat standard terms, you might encounter others. Platinum or diamond open access generally refers to open access that is achieved by publication in a journal that makes articles open access upon publication and does not charge an APC. College and research libraries would be a prime example of this open access pathway. Libre open access generally refers to open access that is achieved by publication in a journal that makes articles open access upon publication and relaxes some of the restrictions afforded by copyright. Although in this case, Libre open access refers to relaxed licensing terms, it doesn't tell you which of the terms have been relaxed, so be sure to look at the licensing on a case-by-case -case basis when determining what users would be permitted to do with your work. These concepts can be a little abstract, so let's practice identifying open access pathways using real-life scenarios. Scenario number one. You've just written a piece about the use of 3D printers in your department, and you'd like to place it in a journal in which all pieces are immediately open access upon publication. Which open access pathway makes most sense to you? Pause the video while you consider your response and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. If you guessed gold, you're correct. It's kind of a trick question because it could be diamond or platinum as well, because all of these pathways require the work to be born open access. The thing that makes the difference is the APC, or the article processing charge. Gold typically requires a processing fee, whereas diamond and or platinum does not. Scenario number two. You have a successful podcast and will be self-publishing an ebook about how to get started podcasting in your discipline. You want to make the content available to draw in clients for your consulting business, but you also want to be able to paywall the content if it seems like it might become a source of income. Which open access pathway makes most sense for your ebook? Pause the video while you consider your response and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. If you guessed bronze or gratis, you're correct. In this case, you would be making your work openly accessible without openly licensing it. Posting something to the web does not in and of itself make something openly licensed. Scenario number three. You want to make your most recent article openly accessible, but you've already published the paper in a traditional journal. The librarian sits down with you and your contract and notes that the publisher has given you permission to deposit the accepted, but not final, version of the article in the library's repository. If you go this route, in what type of open access will you be engaging? Pause the video while you consider your response and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. If you guessed green, you're correct. In this scenario, a version of a previously published non-open access work is being made openly accessible by deposit in an open repository. Again, it's important to note that what can be deposited, when that item can be deposited, and where that item can be deposited is generally set forth in the publication contract, which should be reviewed thoroughly before selecting and depositing work in a repository. Scenario number four. Congratulations, you've just had a chapter accepted for an edited collection. Your editors inform you that the publishers are giving contributors the option of paying a fee to make their chapters free to read and download for readers on the publisher's site. If contributors opt not to pay, their work will be accessible only to readers who pay for the work or have access through their libraries. This is an example of which open access pathway. Pause the video while you consider your response and hit play when you're ready to check your answer. If you guessed hybrid, you're correct. Because authors are given the option to publish open access, and because open access material will be published alongside non-open access material, we would consider this pathway to be hybrid open access. Now that we've talked about how an article becomes open access, we should probably address another common question. Is there a citation advantage to publishing open access? In theory and logically, yes, absolutely. Work that isn't paywalled is easier to access, Therefore, if more scholars have the opportunity to access your work unhindered, you increase the odds of being cited by those who might otherwise not have had access to journals that require subscriptions. So what does the research tell us? Well, it tells us that we need more research. There are lots of articles that say there's an advantage and lots that say there isn't, so the jury is still out on this one. In the absence of conclusive findings, I always like to ask researchers to think about it on a very local and admittedly very unscientific level. 
Consider this. Have you, or a colleague you may know, ever opted not to use an article solely because you could not access it quickly and easily? Chances are, if you've made that decision about others' work, others may have had to make or will have to make that decision when facing barriers to accessing your work. Open access is often perceived as extremely expensive and out of budget for most scholars. And while it's true that there are definitely publications with astronomical article or editorial processing charges, there are also many open access publications that are subsidized by scholarly societies, institutions of higher education, and governmental agencies across the globe. These are just a few of the APC-free options available through major publishers. This doesn't even begin to cover the small and independent open access journals that do not charge APCs at all. Finally, the biggest misconception I've encountered and continue to encounter is the idea that open access means automatically relinquishing one's copyright. Generally, whether you are dealing with a traditional publication or an open access publication, your ability to retain copyright depends on the agreement you make with the publisher. Traditional publishers almost always require you to transfer your claim to copyright. I just published an article in a journal called Serial Reviews, which is a Taylor and Francis publication, and I had to transfer copyright. If you've published in a non-open access journal and you think you've retained copyright, I highly encourage you to check your contract. You may be surprised at what you've signed away. Now, this isn't to say that open access publications don't ask you to transfer copyright. Some do and some don't. The point is, with an open access journal, it's more likely than not that you will have the opportunity to retain your rights to the piece. However, this usually comes with a requirement that you license your work under a specific open license. We're not going to focus on all the open licenses in this presentation, but just be aware that at their most restrictive, these licenses give permission to users to retain, reproduce, and redistribute copies of a work in its original form with an attribution to the original work for non-commercial purposes only. At their most lenient, these open licenses will allow users to retain, reproduce, remix, revise, and redistribute works accompanied with an attribution to the original work for commercial or non-commercial purposes. Many open access journals have a preferred license but many also allow authors to select the license which best meets their needs and comfort level. As I said, I'm not going to go over each and every one of the licenses today, but you have two options for learning more. If you would like to know more about the licenses, you can check out the recording of the webinar I did for SUNY CPD, linked to in the description of this video. Or, if and when you decide you're interested in the possibility of publishing with a specific open access journal, you can send me the link to the journal and I can explain to you what the journal's preferred license means for your work and how to select a different license if you're not comfortable with the publisher's default open license option. So, that still leaves the question of who's going to pay if you find an open access journal that requires an article processing charge. Unfortunately, in order to give you access to all of the stuff that is currently paywalled, the library cannot also subsidize individual faculty members' article processing charges. The budget just can't handle that. So what do you do? First, I suggest seeking out APC-free alternatives. There may be great options, or there may be none depending on your discipline and research focus. But that's why I'm here to help you find the best home for your work so that you can get it out into the world and document it in your tenure file. Second, if there's no alternative, go the green route. Although I am not a lawyer and I cannot give you legal advice about any contracts that you may enter into with a publisher, I can help you determine what version of your manuscript you can share, and I can help you share it through our repository. It may not be the version of record with all its fancy formatting on the publisher's site, but at least it's available to those who would not otherwise have had access to your work. Finally, finding funding can be difficult, but it's not impossible. First, have a conversation with your chair. They may be aware of funding that could offset the cost of an APC. Also, reach out to whatever scholarly or professional society to which you belong. There may also be funding options there as well. 
Also, reach out to these organizations and let them know that you want your dues subsidizing open access options. Many scholarly societies and institutions work with major publishers to offset the cost of open access publishing. If your organization isn't doing this, voice your desire to see this prioritized. Many open access journals also have fee waivers or reduction options. This varies journal to journal. Even if there seems to be no formal program, always reach out to the editor with questions about your options. Finally, many grants are now accompanied by an open access requirement. As such, if you're writing a proposal, reach out to the funder and discuss whether or not APC coverage can be built right into the grant itself so that you don't have to worry about covering this cost after the manuscript has been written up. Now, the fun stuff, finding open access publications. We'll start with library licensed resources that can help. First, we're going to look at locating open access publications by discipline in Cabell's Scholarly Analytics. Then we'll explore how to use Primo, our discovery system, to locate open access publications. To access Cabell's Scholarly Analytics, navigate to the library homepage. From here, click Databases under the search field. Locate Cabell's in the A to Z list. If off campus, enter your credentials when prompted. Once in Cabell's, you can search for open access publications by discipline. For example, select Journalytics, then select Filters. Click the Disciplines drop down menu and select your discipline and, if desired, a topical focus within that discipline. Then, Click Open Access and select your preferred open access pathway. You can select more than one if desired. Each record contains information about the journal, helpful metrics, and mode of open access. If you create and log into an account, you can save journals by clicking the little bookmark icon in the upper right hand corner of each entry. To access Primo, our discovery system, navigate to the library homepage. Click Advanced Search. Enter your disciplinary or topical focus in the keyword field. Then, set material type to journals. Click Search and use the Open Access filter. If you are logged in, you can save journals from your search right to your Primo account. There are also a number of free resources that you can use to identify potential open access publications of interest within your discipline. These include sources, Simago Journal Rankings, World of Science Master Journalist, and the Directory of Open Access Journals. Sources allows you to browse lists of materials indexed in Scopus. To begin, navigate to Sources. You can find a link in the description below. To browse by discipline, select your subject area and click Apply. Then, click the box next to Display Only Open Access Journals. Then, under Source Type, click Journals. Now you can browse a list of open access journals in your discipline. To learn more about a journal, simply click the title. Each record will provide you with basic information about the journal, a link to the journal's homepage, and helpful metrics such as CiteScore, SJR, and SNP metrics. To search the Simago journal rankings, navigate to the SJR site. You can find a link in the description below. First, select a subject from the subject area drop-down menu. Then, if applicable, select a subject category from the subject category drop down menu. Then, click Only Open Access Journals. To learn more about an open access journal of interest, click the title of the journal. Each entry will provide you with basic information about the journal, refer you to similar journals, and provide you with additional SJR related metrics. 
To search the World of Science Master Journalist, begin with the basic search page. You can find a link in the description below. Begin with a keyword search relating to your discipline or topical focus. Then click Search. From here, click the Open Access filter to limit to publications listed in the directory of open access journals. It may also be helpful to use the category limiter to refine your search further. To learn more about an open access journal of interest, click View Profile Page. You will need to create and log into an account in order to view these profile pages. Creating an account is free. Each entry will provide you with basic information about the journal, as well as the journal citation indicator metric. To search the directory of open access journals, begin with the basic search page. You can find a link in the description below. Begin with a keyword search relating to your discipline or topical focus. Make sure to select journals, then click search. You may find it helpful to narrow your search further by using the subject limiter. Also note that the No APC filter option is available. Clicking this box will filter out open access journals which charge an article processing charge. If you would like to learn more about a title, just click the title. Each entry contains basic information about the journal as well as information about the journal's preferred open license and rights retention policies. Now that we've discussed open access and cleared up some of the common misconceptions, it's important that we discuss navigating the world of publishing safely. To do so, you'll need to understand what predatory publications are and how to avoid them. You'll also want to be confident about submitting your work to publications with which you may not be familiar, and COPE's principles of transparency and best practices in scholarly publishing can offer a useful framework when gauging a journal's practices. So. What are predatory publications? Predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. Here's just one example of aggressive and indiscriminate practices. I receive emails just like this on a regular basis, inviting me to publish in journals representing disciplines in which I have absolutely no expertise. We're not going to go over every single point in depth, as I've posted the link to Cope's principles in the description below. However, I encourage you to pull up this anytime you run across a journal with which you are not familiar, even if it isn't an open access publication. Here are some points to consider based on the principles. First, consider the website. Is it professional looking? Is it full of typos? To me, one of the easiest ways to tell if you're dealing with a predatory publication is by looking at the aims and scope note. If this isn't there, be wary. If it is, but it's incredibly broad or covers multiple disciplines, that should be a red flag as well. Why? Because covering one discipline very broadly, or covering multiple disciplines in a manner that's not interdisciplinary, expands the pool of potential submissions, which in turn increases revenue for the journal. The same is true for the name of the journal. If it's trying to cover a broad area or multiple disciplines, that should be a red flag. It should also be a red flag if it sounds very similar to an existing publication. For instance, if you see something like Harvard Review of Business, it's clearly trying to sound like the Harvard Business Review, and this should be a cause for concern. Also consider the peer review process. Does the journal communicate the nature of the review process and any associated policies? It's a cause for concern if it doesn't, and it's also a cause for concern if the website promises a quick turnaround. As someone who has served as a journal reviewer, I can tell you that there's no way I can turn around an article in a week, and even if I could, that means I probably was not being as thorough as I should have been. You'll also want to consider who owns or manages the journal. Again, is the name deliberately similar to a bigger, maybe more well-known publisher? For example, you've heard of Cambridge University Press, but there is also a press that goes by the name of Cambridge Scholars Press, which, even if it is completely legitimate, uh, is named in such a way that it would be easy to confuse the two. Consider also the governing body and editorial team for the journal. Does the journal state its editorial board? Does it provide the full names of members and their affiliations and their contact information? 
Is there a full address for the editorial board? This too is a really good area for telling if you're dealing with a less than legitimate publication, especially those that look really, really professional. Double check that the editors and their affiliations match up to the institutions they are said to be working at. Now, do keep in mind that sometimes these sites steal people's information from college directories, so it may match up because of that. So you can do two things. If there are pictures of the editorial board, do a Google image search. In the past, doing this has allowed me to find that the same person was listed on multiple editorial boards in completely unrelated disciplines. You can also reach out to members of the editorial board with a quick question at their university email address. Now, you don't have to say, hey, is this legitimate? Because that might be a little awkward um, if it is. But you can reach out with the idea of getting more information about becoming a reviewer for the journal, with a question about whether your manuscript might be a good fit for the journal, and so on. It's a good thing to do because many times these faculty don't even know that they've been listed as part of the editorial board for a fake journal. And if the reaction is, I don't edit that journal, then you know exactly what you're dealing with. Consider also copyright and licensing information. Does the journal make it clear who retains copyright to the article? Does the journal explain what you're permitted to do with your article post-publication if you transfer copyright to the publisher? Does the journal identify a specific open license? There are six Creative Commons licenses. If the journal says it licenses its articles under Creative Commons and doesn't specify a license, this should be a cause for concern. Also consider author fees. What fees, if any, does the publisher charge? If specific fees are not listed, don't assume that there is no fee. I've heard of many authors having their work accepted and then being asked to pay a processing fee that wasn't listed on the website. You should know all the costs up front. If there's no information about fees, that's another cause for concern. Consider also whether the journal clearly states its position on identifying and handling research misconduct. Policies about how the journal will handle research misconduct, plagiarism, manipulation of data, citation tampering, and so on should be clearly stated on the site. Next, you'll want to consider the journal's publishing schedule, access for readers, and indexing. How often does the journal publish? How the journal makes material available to readers should also be clearly stated. This is another great way for catching a predatory journal. Often, journals will say that they are indexed in a specific database. We can check that very easily in most cases just by going to the database, provided that we have it, and doing a search. It's very easy. I'd also like to drive home the fact that being indexed in Google Scholar really means nothing. Google Scholar is a search engine, like regular Google. It's not a database. There is no quality control whatsoever. All that's required is to make sure that you formatted your material in a way that Google Scholar can crawl it and index it. It's not being indexed in the sense that a journal is indexed with a vendor like EBSCO, ProQuest, or Gale. These vendors utilize subject experts to weed out the junk journals and include the legitimate journals. It's like an added layer of peer-reviewed, which is one of the many reasons databases are so expensive. Google Scholar not only doesn't do this, they actually give explicit instructions that anybody running a website can follow to ensure that their work pops up in a Google Scholar search. You'll also want to consider archiving. How the work published by the journal is going to be preserved and archived should be clearly stated. I've worked with more than one faculty member who published with a predatory publication, and when that journal got shut down, their work disappeared forever into the internet abyss because there was no preservation policy. Finally, you'll want to consider revenue, advertising, and direct marketing. How the journal supports itself should be clearly stated. Also, if the journal accepts advertising, a policy regarding what types of advertising are acceptable and who makes those decisions regarding advertising should be clearly stated on the site. Finally, going back to the email I showed you in a previous slide, if you learn about a journal from an email or another direct marketing tactic, the key here is that it should be well-targeted and unobtrusive. 
If you're getting requests to submit your work and it looks like a mass mailing, just mark it as spam. While I've introduced you to some helpful tools and frameworks today, remember that your subject expertise is the best line of defense in the fight against predatory and low quality journals. Even if you are satisfied with your evaluation of a publication using the resources I've shared, be sure to read at least three sample articles from the publication you're considering before submitting your work. If at any point you find yourself asking, how'd this get past a reviewer and a copy editor? While you read the samples, that's a good indication that it's probably not a venue worthy of showcasing your scholarship. That's all the reason you need to reject it. I know I've probably overloaded you with information today, so here's what to do to get started after this session. Use the library and freely available resources recommended earlier in this webinar to locate an open access publication of interest. Then access Cabell's to see if it's listed under predatory reports. Just click predatory reports at the top of the page and enter the name of the journal in the field to see if it has any violations. If it does, go back to the beginning. If it doesn't, remember that just because a journal may not be listed under Cabell's predatory reports doesn't mean it's all clear. Check to see if there's an entry for it under journalytics in Cabell's to learn more about it if you didn't initially discover it through Cabell's in the first place. Whether or not there's a record for the journal, you should then conduct your own evaluation. If it doesn't meet most of the criteria laid out by COPE's principles, you might want to go back to the beginning and start over. If it does, read at least three sample articles before submitting your work to make sure that you're comfortable with the publication. If you have any questions, you can always contact me. I'm happy to assist. If you would like proof of completion of the webinar, access the session quiz in the description below. This quiz can only be accessed by logging into your institutional G Suite account. So be sure that you are logged in with your Farmingdale State College G Suite account and not your personal G Suite account.